chapter 9. We continue our message series today in the book of Daniel. It's the 15th part of our series as we're working through it. And I want to talk to us today on the theme of pleading prayer. The theme of pleading prayer. This morning I want to help you with one of the most powerful ways of worship. One of the greatest gifts that God has given His people. One of the most soul-satisfying and truly world-changing, nation-changing graces God has given us. That of pleading prayer. If I were to ask you to be honest this morning, don't raise your hand, but just think in your heart, do you find it hard to pray? Do you know even how to pray, to really pray? Do you have a drop of excitement about prayer today? Do you value prayer? Have you ever been changed by prayer? This is what I hope to help you with this morning, because I think most Christians would answer no to a lot of those things, unfortunately. It is not natural to pray, because prayer is totally selfless. Prayer is setting everything aside for what matters most of all. So we're going to read today about the pleading prayer of Daniel. One that is a passionate, it is prayerful praying. It is the heart and mind united together. A model of devout, humble, fervent, effective prayer. It's this model of prayer we're going to see in which one takes hold of God and takes hold of self. As Isaiah 64 says, running to God with empty hands, no pretensions. One hand holding on to the throne of grace. The other hand holding on to the cross. Mind and heart united together. And something happens deep inside you that maybe has never happened before. It is a prayer with an intense spirit, a fixed heart, zeal of mind, a fervency of soul, a holy confidence of who God is, freedom and boldness that will pierce heaven itself. Do you ever pray and feel like you didn't make it very far up? Like maybe your prayers only made it about five feet above your head before they came falling back down? Well, that is not the kind of prayer we're going to see today in Daniel chapter 9. I can imagine that William Carey felt like his prayers went about five feet up and fell back down. Because William Carey was this missionary called to the nation of India. He worked there eight years and never saw one person saved. And yet he knew God called him to go to India. I have a picture of William Carey in my office because I think he's just such an incredible, really inspirational man of God used in a wonderful way. William Carey said that during those eight years before the first conversion of an Indian from Hinduism to Christianity, he said it was during those years he learned to pray as never before. And yet I'm sure as he was praying for the people he loved and wanted to see God do something great, he felt his prayers were just coming down. And yet all of a sudden, I think, Kerry had this connection with God as he battled trying to learn how to pray. William Kerry says, and I quote him, I feel that it is good to commit my soul, my body, my all into the hands of God. Then the world appears little. The promises of God appear great. And God is my all-sufficient portion. I want you to be able to say that when we're done today. That you know what it means to commit your soul and your body and your all into the hands of God. And that you have truly, with all your affections, prayed. Now, it's an understood that we can learn from Daniel about prayer, isn't it? I mean, go back in our sermon series, Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's life is on the line if he will not give up private prayer. And what does Daniel do? He keeps on praying. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel's life and all the wise men of Babylon's life are on the line. If they cannot find out the dream and the interpretation of the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel calls an emergency prayer meeting which saves the lives of countless men and women. And also gets a word from God so he can give the interpretation of the dream. Friends, many of us pray. We may pray with understanding, but we do not pray with deep, soul-penetrating, pleading earnestness. A lot of us pray with earnestness. We, We pour our hearts before God, but we have no understanding in prayer. And yet the two together are a powerful combination. That's what we find in Daniel chapter 9. So if you'll look with me, read with me beginning at verse 1, and then we will pray and ask God 
to take us to the school of prayer this morning. By the way, this prayer, before we read, I need to say this. This prayer is a model prayer for someone who knows who God is and has a burden for the people around them. Particularly in this election season, with the month of November near, and presidential candidates, and senators, and local people wanting our votes. Oh, how we need to hear this prayer, because this is a national prayer, as much as it is a pleading prayer from the heart. Look with me at Daniel 9. It says, In the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Hear this. Then I set my face toward the Lord God, to make requests by prayer and supplication, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God. And I made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him, and with those who keep His commandments, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belong shame of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against You. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness that we have rebelled against Him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws, which He set before us by His servants the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed Your law, has departed so as not to obey Your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against Him. He has confirmed His words, which He spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which He does, though we have not obeyed His voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought Your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made Yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all Your righteousness, I pray, let Your anger and Your fury be turned away from Your city, Jerusalem, Your holy mountain, because for our sins, for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and Your people are reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. Let us pray. O God, I pray right now that we would hear the heart of Daniel. And that we would know what pleading prayer is. O God, that we would not be overwhelmed with intellectual words, but that we would hear the heart of you. That we would hear what you're saying to us today. And God, that you would burden us. That our prayer lives would be changed. That we would get beyond praying. That we would have prayerful praying. Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be united like never before. 
And we will give you praise as you help us, as you teach us to pray. This is our most humble request in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Verses 1 through 3 are an introduction. He says, this all happened to me in the first year of King Darius. Now, this is the same Darius of chapters 5 and chapter 6 of Daniel. King Darius, if you remember, was appointed the administrator over the Babylonian Empire. As verse 1 says, he was made the administrator. King Cyrus, the leader of Medo-Persia, came outside of Babylon, conquered the city of Babylon, and set Darius up in the place of the Babylonian government. Now, when Daniel experienced this and saw this happen, all of a sudden he began to question things. You see, he realized that God is in control. He realized that God is in control of world leaders, of world events, that nothing escapes the Lord's attention. And when this happened, he began to contemplate what effect the turn of events would have on his people, the Jewish people. What effect these events would have on his life by the hand of God. So we see in verse 2 what Daniel does. Now, remember, Daniel does not have the Bible that we have today, but he had some of the Bible we had today. And so he runs to the Bible. It says he understood by the books. He went to the Word of God for help. Now, be amazed by this. Daniel is a prophet. Daniel is a politician. Daniel is a prime minister of a state of one of the greatest monarchs, actually, at that time, second to the greatest monarch of all the earth. And yet, he found both heart and time to read the Word of God. It was that important to him. God's Word was that much of a guidepost, was that much of a treasure, that he found it important to stop and to trust in it rather than his own wisdom and experience. Now let me ask you a question today. How many of us are prophets like Daniel? How many of us are great prime ministers and busy leaders of a country? How much more an important role should the Bible play in our lives? Isn't that true? How much more of an important role? The greatest and best in this world should never think themselves above the Bible, above the Word of God. Daniel read it. He studied it. He thoroughly considered it. He weighed it well in his mind. Now remember, Daniel was 80 years old at this point, and he was still learning from God. I think of a very faithful pastor and teacher uh, that I was very familiar with. This guy in his 90s kept reading modern books that were being written about the Bible, as well as reading the Bible every day, passionately, thoroughly. People would ask him. He wasn't a pastor anymore. He had stepped down from full-time pastoral ministry years ago. He couldn't keep up with it, but he still preached once in a blue moon as God gave him the availability. And people would ask him, why are you reading books about theology and some of the attacks on the Word of God that are today? Why in the world are you reading that stuff? What are you going to do with it? And he said, I love God. And so I want to know God better. And to know God better, you also need to know those who are coming against Him. He said, I may never preach it from a pulpit, but it feeds my soul. My friends, Daniel's 80 years old. He's still learning from God. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter your age. God is always our teacher. He is always opening His treasures before us if we are willing. So he goes and he starts reading the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. He begins reading the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 25 and 29. And he sees there, amazingly, God said that the Jewish people would be exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon for a period of 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, God would strike down the king of Babylon. Let me read it to you, Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. The prophet says this years before it happens. The whole land will become a ruin and a waste. These nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. The same thing in Jeremiah 29.10. Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. I mean, the weatherman, 
man can't even get the weather for tomorrow right. And this prophet says this is going to happen in exactly 70 years. And guess what? This is the amazing thing about this. In the year 538 B.C., Daniel is reading these words. In the year 605 B.C., the people were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. God judged the king of Babylon 67 years after the exile. Daniel's reading this. Maybe he never read Jeremiah before. Maybe the the Jeremiah scroll never made it to him until this point. And as he reads it, God opens his eyes and he says, Holy cow, we're 67 years into this thing. We're almost done. I mean, he starts doing the math and he realizes God's word is true. And he's blown away by it, as you should be when you hear this. That God, when He says something, He does it down to the very day. Down to the very second. Verse 3. How does he respond to seeing the promises of God coming to fruition? To being fulfilled? A lot of people are fatalistic. They say, well, God's going to do it, and that's good enough. And I can just stay out of the way and do my own thing. Not so with someone who loves God. See, if you're on God's team, you want to get in the play. I don't know how many of you were athletes. There's a lot of athletes in this church and former athletes. But if you were on the team, you wanted to get on the field, didn't you? It's not as fun sitting on the bench. And that's the same way with the family of God. If you're in the family of God, it is not as fun sitting on the bench. I mean, when you hear the things of God, you want to use them. You want to get out there and do something with them. I mean, enough of the holy huddle Christianity. Let's go and make disciples. Let's do the work of God, because you will find joy in it. So look how he responds, verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God, to make requests by prayer and supplication, with fasting, with sackcloth and ashes. He begins to pray about what he read. Let me tell you something. When you read the Bible, you need to learn to try to pray what you read. This week, now I fail at doing this a lot. I stand here as a man convicted about this. This week I was reading Psalms 101. It wasn't my regular time with God, personal time outside of the office and studying for sermons. Uh, It it just happened I had a a spare minute. And I did what a lot of you do. I picked the Bible up and I took the magic finger. Have you ever got the magic finger? And I just picked something and read it because I had a minute. And I read Psalms 101. And when I got to the, I think the fourth and fifth verse, God just slammed me with words and he hit my heart. And I had to stop and pray what I read. I had to pray it for myself, pray it for my family, pray it for my home, pray it for our church. And and all this week, I keep going back to Psalms 101. And I can't get, I think it's verse 5, I can't get past past verse 5. I just have to stop and keep praying it because I'm overwhelmed with it. Try that sometime. Don't try to read just to read for intellectual reasons. Read to hear God and then respond and pray and ask God to make it true in your life. Oh, how it will transform you. You see, as Spurgeon has said, there is no word that can prevail with God like His own. So if you want to have a prayer life that is powerful, plead the promises of God. Plead the things of God. Believe the things of God. Live the things of God. He built his prayer life on the Word of God. He knew effective prayer comes out of not just hearing and reading and knowing God's Word, but applying it to the heart of you and me. His intellect from reading Jeremiah and his heart combined at that moment. And prayer was just busting out of him. Determination, engagement, fixed, firm thoughts, firm faith, fervor of affection and love for God just spilled over because he heard the voice of God. This was God intimacy and God dependency all rolled into one. Amazing. Now, you may hear all those adjectives and all those words, and it means nothing to you. And if that's the case, oh, I want you to have a burden in your heart. I want you to realize how dangerous it is not to ever hear the voice of God and respond in prayer. So, he begins to pray, but I want you to notice in verse 3, it's not his ordinary prayer. It's not his Daniel 6, verse 10, praying in his house three times a day. We see him praying with fasting, with sackcloth, with ashes. God's Word had so affected his heart, his person, he was physically shook up. He came to God emptied of himself. He came to God empty.
emptied of all His greatness and glory, emptied of all His self-righteousness, He fell flat before the face of God and realized, it is not of me. It is of God's mercy that I can even speak to Him. Signs of intense mourning and humility and repentance. By the way, amazing. Did you know there's not a single sin of Daniel recorded in the Bible? Not a single fault against the prophet. Yet he knew he was nothing. He knew it wasn't about him. It wasn't about his righteousness. As he does this, he is saying, God, I don't want it to be about me. I empty myself of anything that I think is good about me. It is all about you. Oh, that's hard to do when the television's on and Facebook wants to be updated and the new cable television premiere is on tonight and your kids have this activity. they got music lessons and ball games and your job keeps calling you nonstop. It's hard to do that, isn't it? But this is what we have to fight for. Now, some might wonder why this old Jew is so broken. It's so bothered. I mean, the guy's in his mid-80s. The guy has attained success. He is prime minister to the very leader of Babylon. He has a fine palace. He has competent servants. Plenty of money. The finest the kingdom could afford. Because of his age, he would most certainly never go back to Israel again. Why didn't he just relax and enjoy his retirement? Like the American dream says, all you do is you work until... You hit retirement and then you just enjoy retirement and do nothing else. The reason why is he loved his nation because he loved his God. He loved his people because he loved his God. He was a godly patriot and he knew before his nation could be saved, there would have to be forgiveness from God and a very heaven sent revival. Let me give a challenge to you who are older in this congregation today. Either mature in the faith or older in age. Listen to this. Do you not care about what your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to have to go through or are going through right now? Do you not care? Look at the United States of America. Do you not have a burden? Are you not bothered by it? Don't write off the next generation. Don't write off this country. Do as Daniel here, plead to the God who can change hearts and lives. Oh, be broken as Daniel and realize you can't change this nation. Let me tell you something. I don't care if it's the Republican or the Democrat Party. They cannot change this nation. They cannot do it. Let me tell you, local leaders cannot change this nation. Only heaven sent revival will change anybody. Oh, how we need to be broken. When you see those grandkids, pray for them, pray over them, put your hands on them, and pray the blessings of God upon them. Those great-grandchildren, pray for them. Be an example. Take them with you to do something for God. Look, if you're going to deliver some food to someone in need, take them with you. I was talking to a dad yesterday. He's taking his son to NLO. On Sundays, and the boy is just going out, and he's serving meals in Jesus' name. And this young kid was telling me, he's a young teenager, God has pierced his life because dad thought it was important to give some time to that next generation. Oh man, don't waste it. Be broken for them. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God. Here's the prayer. I made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly and rebelled by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. We have not heeded Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in Your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Many people, when they hear the promises of God, sit back. Not Daniel. When Daniel heard the promise of God, he was broken hearted. He was affected by God. Because while God works through His own timetable, His own plans, while God is sovereign, nevertheless He chooses to use us. Because He is good. And so we need to get on our knees and then get off our knees and do something about it. As the church father Augustine said, pray as if everything depends on God and then work as if everything depends on you. That's what God wants from His people. 
He says, Lord. By the way, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in verse 4. This is the first time in the book of Daniel, the name, the covenant name of God. I am that I am. Yahweh. Jehovah. The the covenant keeping God. The first of seven times this name is used in the book of Daniel. It is only used in Daniel's prayer. Now, if you wonder why it has not been used in the book of Daniel, most people think because the Jews were not in the land of Israel anymore. They were not in the land of covenant anymore. And so because they were separated from the land, they didn't call God Yahweh. They were calling Him Adonai, Lord, Sovereign, Master. But they did not call Him by His covenant name. But I think Daniel is teaching us here something very important. Even if you're exiled from home, God still keeps His covenants with His people. Even if you're the prodigal son eating slop, God, if He has a covenant, He is pursuing you. He is still Yahweh. He is still Jehovah. No matter where you are, God's promises hold firm. That's why a William Carey could be in India and learn how to pray and have no fruit for eight years and yet know God is going to keep His word. God didn't call him to India in vain. That is why God has called you and He will keep His word. He has not called you in vain. Either, Oh God, oh Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, great and awesome God. Daniel began his prayer where we all should by recognizing the greatness and the goodness of God. We approach God like He's some stingy grouch who must be persuaded to give us something. We approach God not like a father. We approach God like a Grinch. And yet I want you to notice here, And 67 years of Daniel being in captivity, of Daniel waiting. Daniel had not lost hope in who God is. Daniel knew the problem has never been with God. Did you hear that this morning? If you've got problems in your life, the problem is not with God. It never has been with God. He is the God who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him. In other words, fidelity and truth are characteristics of God. In contrast to the people of Israel's mess, their unfaithfulness, God has always been faithful. God didn't like stop coaching the team somewhere in the middle of the game and just give up on Israel. He's been the coach the whole time. It's the players who are a mess. God, you've been faithful. This prayer contains three elements that I want to run through, unfortunately, very quickly. I hope one day that we can come through and do like six parts in this prayer. But we're going we're gonna to just rock it through it this morning. So, high speed. I hope you had an energy drink. The first thing that we're going to see of the three elements of this prayer, number one is a confession for the people's sins. Getting real with God. He says in verse 5, we have sinned. We have sinned. Oh, don't take that for granted. Don't say it because it's the thing to say. Say it with weight. Say it with truthfulness. Daniel hid nothing concerning the evils of Israel. He did not defend nor excuse the guilt of his people. You know, I listen to people pray. That's what I do. I'm a pastor. I I encourage people to pray all the time. Everyone wants me to pray for them, and I do. But I love to hear other people pray too. Because if I do all the praying, guess what? I start making it a job. And God forbid that it ever becomes a job. By the way, God forbid because your prayers are just as important to God as mine. Why? Because you're His child just like I am. Amen? Now, when I pray, I also listen to other people when they pray. And I hear people all the time try to vindicate themselves when they pray. To justify themselves. To make excuses for God. It would be easy when you're praying to say, Oh God, help me because of all these problems that you've let happen, God. To complain to God about the problems of life. But instead of complaining, Daniel said, The buck stops here. Daniel confessed. He didn't complain. As the the great English writer G.K. Chesterton said, what is the problems in the world? As he wrote to the London Times, what is the greatest problem facing the world today? He wrote two words to the London Times, and they printed it as an op piece. I am. Signed, yours affectionately, G.K. Chesterton. I am. I am the problem. You see, too many of us today are complainers, and you call that praying. Did you like it when your kids complained or presently complained to you? Well, why in the world do you think God wants your word vomit? Explain to me why. 
He doesn't come wanting your complaints. He wants your confession. He wants your heart. He says, we've done wrong. We've acted wickedly. We've rebelled. We've turned aside from your commandments and your rules. Equivalent to saying, we have sinned in every way possible. James 2.10 Whoever shall keep the law and offend in one point is guilty of all. We didn't listen to your prophets. They came. They called on us. It's like the, the pastors, the evangelists, the leaders in the church, the teachers in the church, the people with the gifts of teaching. They have called on us to use what God has given us. They have called on us. They have taught us the things of God in the name of God, by the authority of God, being sent by God, delivering His message as ambassadors to all the people of the land, to the kings and to the poorest guy in the nation of Israel. They gave us the message unrestricted. And what did Israel do? They ignored the message and killed the messengers. That's what they did. Adrian Rogers said the problem with preachers today is no one wants to kill them anymore. If no one wants to kill them, it's because they're not giving the message. You can believe it. That's the problem with preaching today. See, preaching should make you mad, sad, or glad, but it better do something. Friends, you read this here and you've got to examine your heart. Do you recognize that there are times when you should hear the voice of God and you've ignored Him? When you should hear the messenger of God and you keep doing it your way? He says in verse 7, righteousness belongs to you. No murmuring, no complaining. He's saying, God, I have the utmost confidence in the way you rule, in your government. I don't think for a moment you've been too hard on Israel. In fact, you were the one who drove us out of the land because of our unfaithfulness. When God punishes, He does it because we deserve it. For a just cause. Why does God correct us? Because He loves us. My friends, one of the things I've been learning as a parent is that when we correct our children, we do not say, be good to make God happy. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but that is exactly the opposite of the gospel. We say, do good because you love God and God loves you. You see, and the reason why God had to correct them is because He loved them. And the whole time, the the leaders, not the prophets, but the leaders were saying, if you do good, they fell into moralism. Do good and you'll make God happy. No, there's only one who's ever done any good and made God happy, and that's Jesus. You do good because you love Him. Because He's good. And you know how that is. If your kids just do good to make you happy, that's a lot different than when they do good because they love you. And they want nothing in return. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face. Verse 9, but to you, our God, belongs mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against you, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. All Israel has transgressed. Oh, how amazing it is here to read this. Not only does all righteousness belong to God, because God is the one who is always right, but all mercy and forgiveness belongs to God, because He is the only one who can give us mercy, and He can only pardon us. From God's goodness, from God's person, from God's nature, there is a river of God's mercy flowing. And from the river of God's mercy, there are tributaries, there are streams of forgiveness flowing through this church and in every church where the people of God assemble. And it all comes from who God is. As Psalms 130 verse 4 says, the psalmist declares, there is forgiveness with you, God. You may not be able to find forgiveness from your spouse, from your children, from your boss, from your neighbor, but you can find it from God ten out of ten times. You can't deplete God's mercy. It is a river that just keeps going. You can't deplete His forgiveness. There's another stream that will pop up somewhere because the cross is of infinite value. One drop of the blood of Jesus could take care of it all if God wanted to. It would appease His wrath. Exodus 34, 6, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law. We have rebelled against Him, but thankfully, God is in the business of helping the rebellious. That's the point of the Gospel. You know, He says here, God, your curse is upon us. Did you know that God warned Israel multiple times, you do this, you lose the land, you do this, you go into captivity? If you're taking notes, go back tonight and read Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30. God said, by the way, this is why we don't believe in replacement theology. 
God said, Israel, if you are following me and you love me with all your heart, mind, and strength, these are the blessings of the land. If you do not do that, if you don't love me and don't follow me because you don't love me, these are the curses you're going to get. For some reason, everyone wants Israel's blessings and no one wants their curses. Go figure that one out. But the fact of the matter is, God warned them. And just like a good parent, you have to warn your children, but sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with what's going on. Or else your children will be lost. He says in verses 12 through 14, God, you've confirmed your words. God's not indifferent to what He said. He will not forget what He has said. His words don't fall to the ground. He has confirmed His words, which He spoke against our judges who judged us. Which has been done to Jerusalem, verse 13, as it's written in the law of Moses. This is no surprise. God said this was going to happen. You see, the problem in that day was the judges and the people, they lived by political expediency. The judges judged by what the people wanted to hear, not by what was right. Does that sound like any leaders that you've heard of lately? The judges judged by popular vote, by greed. And so God laid them waste. From the day of King Josiah dying at Megiddo, 609 B.C., the nation was defeated by the Egyptians, defeated by the Babylonians. They were killed. They were exiled as slaves. The nation of Israel were objects of scorn, deprived of their property, deprived of their freedom, derided for their claim to know the one true God. And if you look at verse 13, the most indicting thing of all, yet we have not made our prayer. Oh, ask yourself if you fit in that category. In spite of all of their mistakes, all of their sin, all of their rebellion, we have not made our prayer. As Daniel confessed the sins of Israel, he came to the sin of prayerlessness. There can be many reasons for our prayerlessness today. Time management, busyness, lack of concentration. But most fundamentally, we ask not because we think we need not. We ask not because we think God can give not. We ask not because we love God not. What does prayerlessness do? It limits and defines your relationship with God. Prayerlessness results in powerlessness. Prayerlessness is rooted in pride. Prayerlessness is rooted in self-sufficiency and lack of discipline. Prayerlessness is an open door to the devil. Do you hear that warning today? John Bunyan said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, as sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Oh, when we are not driven to prayer, this should be a wake-up call, that our hearts are getting cold before God. Let me tell you something, if you're one who is battling prayerlessness today as Israel was, the hardest part of prayer is starting. Do you hear that? The hardest part of prayer is getting it going. It's like one of these CSX trains here in Pensacola. I I can't imagine how many thousands of pounds those trains pull every day. And the hardest part is to get it moving. Once you get it moving, the train goes, doesn't it? That's the hardest part, to start. The easiest thing about praying is quitting, isn't it? It's easy just to stop. And then if you don't get the engine going, you can't get the motor running again. You can't get the train moving. My friends, if we will humble ourselves, as Daniel did here, God will help us. At the same time, if we will not be melted, He will keep us in the furnace until we are melted and the train starts moving again. My friends, there's no other way we can approach God except as sinners seeking His grace, humbled before Him. And now, O Lord our God, who brought Your people, verse 15, out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and made Yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. God, You have done signs and wonders. You did the plagues in Egypt. Oh, think about the the locust, the the river turning into blood, the Nile turning into blood. Think about the, the hail, all these mighty things. God takes Israel out of Egypt after the death of the firstborn. He parts the Red Sea. He provides for them over and over again. God does wonders at Mount Sinai. God, you made a name for yourself. People feared you and loved you for who you are. And yet, God, we have sinned. Oh, Lord, forgive us. We have sinned. By the way, did you notice here that Daniel confesses his sin in the plural here every time? Us. We. He doesn't say they. He says us. We. It's like the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. 
When the, the Pharisee played, prayed, all he talked about was the other guy's sins. But when the tax collector prayed, he said, Oh God, be merciful to me. Now, most translations say, Be merciful to me, a sinner. But that doesn't get it, you see. I think only the New American Standard gets it right. In that passage in the Greek text, the definite article, the, is there. He had no one else on his mind. You can write that in in your Bible if you want to. Oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner, not a sinner. No one else was on his mind but him. Daniel, 32 times here. He does not discount his own sin. As I said earlier, there is not a single sin recorded against Daniel in all the Bible. You know what Daniel could have said? He could have said, Lord, I was only a youth at the fall of of Jerusalem when I was deported to Babylon. It wasn't my fault that the people had sinned. He could have said, Lord, I've led an exemplary life in the wicked city of Babylon for 67 years. You see, when many of us confess sin, we have a tendency to confess the sin of others and make excuses for ourselves. But Daniel was not like this. He took full responsibility. And this is the reason why. Some of you hear all this and you think Daniel is just talking religious talk. That Daniel's confession of sin is phony. But I want you to realize the reason why he confesses like this is because he is passionately pleading before God, mind and heart connected to God. And compared to God, even the most righteous among us falls short every time. And that's why he's pleading. Us, we, it's our fault. A confession for the people's sin. An acknowledgement of God's just judgment. Lastly, a plea for God's mercy. Verse 16, O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city because of our sins. Verse 17, our God, hear the prayer of your servant. For the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary. O my God, verse 18, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see. He only cares about God. His prayer is about God. He loves God. And that's why He loves His neighbor. That's why He loves His community. Cause your face to shine again upon us. The idea here is the sun. You know, when it's a sunny day, it's cheerful. Everyone's happy. When it's a sunny day outside, the illusion is favor, mercy of God. When it's a cloudy day, doom and gloom. And He's saying, God, turn us again and cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. Psalms 80 verse 3. When the the face of the Lord is shining upon you, it is God favoring you, His blessings on you. All true prayer has its seat in a desire for the glory of God, for the excellence of God's character to be displayed. Do it for your sake, O Lord. Hear the prayer of your servant. Look at verse 18. You've got to just hear this. We do not present because of our righteous deeds, but your great mercy. Look, when you pray to God, don't pray to God and ask for His justice like some dummies do. Oh God, be just. Dumb prayer. You don't want God's justice ever. You want God's mercy. God, we do not present because of our righteous deeds, but your great mercy. Not because we deserve it, but because you're merciful and your reputation is at stake. He's pleading on mercy, not his merit. His confidence isn't in his own goodness. It's in God's goodness. The godly flee to God's mercy. They go up the stream of forgiveness. They get to the river of God's mercy and they plunge in head first. That's our plea before God. We renounce our own works and we seek God's mercy. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are not tacking words to the end of a prayer. We are saying and expressing, it is not our merits, it is not our goodness, it is not our righteousness, it is Jesus' blood alone. My friends, I want you to understand that one of Satan's most subtle delusions is he has succeeded in getting thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people to trust in prayer and to pray. There are religious people everywhere praying, countless hours in prayer, but it achieves nothing if we are praying because of our own righteousness. Only praying in the power and in faith in the shed blood of Jesus, in His righteousness alone, is what gains the ear of God. And this ends, verse 19. We wrap it up. Oh, Lord, hear. I'll just hear this. I don't think he said it like that. Let me try it again. Oh, Lord, hear us. Oh, Lord, forgive us. 
O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God. For your city and your people are called by your name. Do you hear passion? Do you hear hear mind and heart, intellect and emotion together before God? This is a moving cry, the kind God loves to answer, a pleading cry. Spurgeon said, oh, that our prayers would get beyond praying till they get to agonizing before God. I cannot make it without you, God. I cannot do it. My marriage will not last. My friendships will not continue. My parenting will never be right. Oh God, I will never be anything unless you are the one I stand on. This is a factual, fervent, prayerful prayer. A mind intent, a heart inflamed, an earnestness that cannot be denied. It was like the sins of Daniel, the sins of his people, his nation, the desolation of the city of Jerusalem, the promises of God, the reproach of the nation that was suffering. All these things came rushing over the soul of Daniel, prompting him to proceed with perhaps the most pleading prayer ever uttered from human lips. Here in this verse. My friends, I want you right now, your sins to overwhelm you. Your prayerlessness to overwhelm you. The the messed up condition of our nation to overwhelm you. What our children and grandchildren are growing up in to overwhelm you. A city, Pensacola, that is broken to overwhelm you. Racial tension that is still prevalent to overwhelm you. Open immorality to overwhelm you. The darkness of our hearts to overwhelm you. And all of a sudden, I want you to plead with God. And all of a sudden, the hardest thing may be to start to pray. But oh, once you get in the river of God, He just takes you going. Oh, it's wonderful. I read a story earlier this week. And when I read it, I knew I had to share it to end this message. So here it is. Hudson Taylor lived in the 1800s. was going to be a missionary to China. One of the first missionaries to inland China. But before he ever made it to China, he worked as a medical assistant. One of his first assignments was a man who had severe gangrene in his foot. He had to take care of this man. The man was an atheist with a violent temper. When someone offered to read scripture to him, this man loudly told him to get out, to leave. When a pastor visited him, the man spit right in his face. Hudson's job was to change the man's bandages every day. But he also started praying for the man's salvation. The first few days, he did nothing to share the gospel. He just went in and focused on carefully changing the man's bandages. This greatly eased the man's pain, and the man was deeply touched by how tender and patient he was with him. I don't know if you've had one of those hack nurses before. Well, trust me, they didn't have the medical skill or abilities they had back then. Hacking was probably just the perfect word to describe what they normally did, but it was not what Hudson Taylor did. He took his time and was affectionate with this man. But you see, Hudson Taylor was concerned. He was concerned for this man's eternal destiny. So the next day, after carefully changing the bandages, he did something different. Instead of heading out the door, he knelt down by the man's bed and he began to share the gospel. He explained his concern for the man's soul. He told of Jesus' death on the cross and that he could be saved from his sins. The man grew furious. The man said nothing and turned his back to Hudson Taylor. So Hudson Taylor left the room. He gathers the medical equipment and he walked out. The pattern continued for some time. Every day Hudson tenderly changed his bandages, then knelt down by the man's bed and spoke of Jesus' love. And every day the man said nothing and would turn his back as Taylor talked. After a while, Hudson Taylor started to wonder, was he doing more harm than good? Were his words causing the man to become more hardened inside against God? So with great sadness, Hudson Taylor decided to stop speaking about Jesus Christ. The next day, he again changed the man's bandages, but instead of kneeling by the bed, he headed toward the door to leave. As he was about to walk out the door, he looked back at the man, and he could see a shocked look on the man's face. Because this was the first day that since Hudson had started sharing the gospel, he had not knelt down by the bed and spoken about Jesus. But while standing at the door... Hudson Taylor's heart fell. I think what happened is that river of God's mercy just right through him. All of a sudden, he started weeping as his heart broke. He went back to the bed and he said, My friend, whether you will hear it or not, I must share what God has put on my heart. And he earnestly spoke of Jesus, again begging the man to pray with him. 
This time the man did not turn his back. The man answered and said, If it will be a relief to you, go ahead and pray. So Hudson Taylor got down on his knees and he prayed for this man's salvation. From that point on, the man was eager to listen to the gospel. And in a few days, that man prayed to trust Christ. My friends, this is what Hudson Taylor said this taught him. He said, quote, Perhaps if we had more of that intense distress for souls, for your children, your grandchildren, your neighbor, your friends, perhaps if we had more of that intense distress that leads to tears, we would more frequently see the results we desire. Sometimes it may be that while we are complaining of the hardness of the hearts of those we are seeking to benefit, the hardness of our own hearts and our own feeble apprehension of the solemn reality of eternal things may be the true cause of our lack of success. Because of his broken heart, Daniel was heard and he soon received his answer. If your heart will get broke before God, you will ask, you will seek, you will knock, he will hear yours. He will heal your heart and you will get yours too. Let us pray. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.